Um, and without further ado, I'll get started here. I'm really, really excited to introduce Julia Blythe. Um, Julia was a intern at the Natural Science Museum um, in the summers of 2010 and 2011, and was a manager there in the summer of 2012. Um, currently, she works at the, as the manager of the um, biological collections at the Mariah Mitchell Association, and also works with the New England Botanical Society at the Farlow Herbarium at Harvard University. Um, also, I wanted to mention, if um, you guys haven't been to the Mariah Mitchell Natural Science Museum, uh, do give us a visit. Um, the collections room um, was very largely uh, curated by Julia, um, and it's a beautiful little um, taste of our vast biological collections. Um, and I'm really, really excited to um, hear about Julia's work and uh, more about the biological collections at the Mariah Mitchell Association. Julia, welcome. Hi, thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm gonna get started right off by sharing my screen. All right, can you see that, Jack? Yeah, it looks good to me. All right, great. Um, so as Jack said, I've been with the MMA since 2010, um, and I'm going to talk today about why collections matter, um, how specimens are used, prepared, um, stored, a little bit of history of the collections at the Murray Mitchell Association, and um, how you can access them. Um, so to start off, um, why collections matter. Um, essentially, Biological collections tell us um, what existed, where, when. Um, so in this case, we're looking at spinulous wood ferns. And the image on the left is um, a plant collected in 1879. Um, and so essentially, we know that um, spinulous wood ferns were on Nantucket back then because this one was collected by a guy in June of that year. And then um, more than 100 years later, <clears throat> Um, Peter Dunwitty and Carol Moffat collected um, the one on the right in 1996 um, in the central moors. Um, so we know that spinulous wood ferns uh, still existed on Nantucket in 1996 and hopefully in um, 2090 or something another botanist will um, find that they still exist on the island. Um, and the older collections tend to not have great location data, um, but more is better. And that helps us return to a site to see if something is still there. So this is an example of a um, Liatris plant, or blazing star, which was collected um, in 1916 by Albert Coffin in the Plains. And I'm kind of assuming that's the head of the Plains area where NCF is managing uh, sand plain grassland and there's still um, Lydris scariosa. Um, so it's great to have uh, collections because they can guide us to the place where we can find plants in the modern day. And populations of rare plants are monitored regularly across the state um, to check to see if they still exist. Another good reason um, for collections to exist is they can back up um, a list. So this particular list was compiled by Charles Johnson in 1930. This is a list of the insects of Nantucket. Um, and Johnson has um, a lot of specimens in our collection. The ones he doesn't have, we kind of have to take his word at his identifications. Um, but of the ones that we do have, um, specimens of, we find that mostly he was right, but occasionally he had a misidentification. So this is an example of his box of pinned galls. These are um, insect sign on plants, which is something my husband Charlie is very interested in. And so when he looked into this box of galls, he said, all right, most of those are right, but that one over on the left, which um, Johnson identified is not uh, correct. Um, this species is only found in the Southwest, the one that um, Johnson identified it as, um, but it is in fact an oak fig gull, um, which is caused by a different wasp and occurs on white oak as well as dwarf chinkapin oak, which is what this is. 
Um, we haven't found these particular galls in the last couple of years of looking, but we found um, leaf galls on dwarf chinkapin oak that turn out to be the same species. So we can know that this species of wasp, wasp found um, here in the 1920s is still around, even though Johnson misidentified it um, in the first place, his specimen allows us to know that. Um, another example is this moth that um, Charles Kimball collected. Um, it was also in that same list of insects from Nantucket in 1930. And um, it was identified first as uh, Gracelaria vacciniella uh, based on the fact that it was reared from blueberry. Um, the name of that moth has changed to Calotilia vacciniella, but the wing pattern tells us that the, the identification was still wrong. Um, so we know that it um, is actually Calotilia porphyretica, um, which is, can be, uh, can live on both blueberry and azalea, but perhaps that wasn't known quite yet at that time. So um, the existence of the specimen helps us verify the identity in the list. Specimens can also um, track changes in species composition over time, which is part of what we're attempting to do with the plants and, and insects that I just laid out. This can be a little tricky because with most vertebrates, um, the Maria Mitchell Association doesn't actively collect animals, we just salvage things. So if a bird dies on its own and someone happens to find it, then it gets added to our collection which means that sometimes um, an absence of a specimen doesn't mean an absence of a species. It just means um, it wasn't, that species wasn't easily found dead, if that makes sense to people. Um, so I'm showing you a cardinal because cardinals did not used to, uh, didn't occur on Nantucket for a long time. Um, and, and this specimen here from 1979 is our first specimen of a cardinal found on Nantucket. So we can't say that um, cardinals definitively weren't here in 1978, but we can say that after 1979, they definitely were here. And in fact, we have a whole drawer of them at this point. Another, um, Example of changes of species composition over time is the American burying beetle. Um, so this is a um, federally endangered insect. Um, it's been reintroduced here starting in the 1990s and this specimen from 1926 was part of the basis of that whole reintroduction project. If we didn't know that American burying beetles already occurred on Nantucket, it would have been hard to justify introducing them here. Another example of changes in species composition over time is represented by barn owls. Um, they are living here in Nantucket at the northern edge of the species range. So our banding and recapture study shows that there's low survival and low breeding success in years with very cold winter temperatures. Um, the, the very first breeding pair was found in 1968, and now there's a very um, large breeding population with dramatic booms and busts based on winter temperatures, and it's sort of supported by provided nesting boxes. So at this point, we have drawers and drawers of barn owls um, starting in the late 60s. But we are still pretty interested in um, obtaining additional specimens particularly since most of, or I wouldn't say most, but a large percentage of the population of barn owls is banded. So if we have specific um, locations for where they were found, then we can figure out um, where the fledglings move to after they fledge. Another um, purpose for natural history collections is to illustrate evolutionary relationships and observe morphological features. So I'm showing you here on the top an American woodcock and on the bottom um, greater yellow legs. So these birds have 
exist in very different habitats. They have really different plumage. The woodcock is obviously um, sort of camouflaged with woods and leaves and um, in a sort of swampy environment. The yellow legs is um, adapted to live in uh, like marshes and um, near the ocean. But you can see like in the hand, they have a very similar body type, big long bill for probing into the sand. So you can kind of tell that um, you, that uh, their morphology reinforces their evolutionary relationship, even though they live very different lives. Um, similarly, here I have a bunch of alcids. That's from the left to the right, a black guillemot, a puffin, a razor bill, common muir, and a dove key. And um, they, you can see here, they have really similar shape and plumages. They're adapted for sort of sitting on top of the water and diving down through and catching fish. They can fly, um, obviously. Um, they have really similar plumage patterns also. Um, so anyway, this sort of reinforces that close evolutionary relationship. These um, bohemian waxwings, interestingly, we actually have four specimens and they were all um, found dead in January of 1994. So if you're not familiar with bohemian waxwings, they're kind of like cedar waxwings, but extra fancy. And I have, I'm pulling them here to show you these very cool um, waxy wing structures. Um, and so these, uh, this is just another example of why you might want a close-up look at a bird specimen. Um, these waxy wing tips are on the secondary feathers and they're a breeding signal of age and health. Um, apparently birds with more and bigger waxy wing tips are older birds and tend to breed e earlier in the season and produce more chicks. Both males and females have them and they will select each other um, based on the similar size, which puts them in the same like age category as their mate. Um, I talked earlier about the importance of lots of data when we prepare specimens, and that includes birds too. So when we prepare them as study skins, we usually dissect them and look inside their stomach. These are yellow and black-billed cuckoos. And I found it very interesting when I skinned my first one and I looked inside, I was like, whoa, there's a, cat a, a caterpillar, like a fuzzy black caterpillar in here. And as I looked at all the other specimens in the drawer, almost, well, more than half of them had notes about their stomach being full of fuzzy caterpillars, some with orange heads, some with uh, black head capsules. So that kind of reinforces what we can see from observing the birds in the wild that they eat pet caterpillars and, and other caterpillars. Um, let's see. So there are some other aspects to collections um, or other uses, including DNA barcoding and stable isotope analysis and other ways about, of learning about species. These things are kind of a little beyond what I do at the MMA, but um, we have to keep in mind that the structure of DNA wasn't even discovered until the 50s. And so people preparing specimens um, couldn't have known that specimens could be used with these types of technologies. And so the same applies now, like we don't know what people will be doing with our specimens in 50 or 100 years down the road. We do have um, a few studies where um, outside researchers have taken samples of specimens of ours to do some um, DNA work on. I think there was um, a project with spotted knapweed and also with, um, uh, I think, Spodro spiders um, a few years ago. Let's see. And then there's like big data, which I also, um, I'm not doing this research, but the idea is that researchers are able to compile data from lots of museums all over the country. And by doing that, they're able to get enough data to create st statistical significance. Um, and this particular example is a study about um, bumblebees. 
So with um, climate change, most or, or many species migrate up north in latitude and uphill in elevation. And by using specimens from 18, the 1870s to 2010 um, across North America and Europe, this study was able to say like, bumblebees don't actually do that. Um, they tend to um, just shrink in their population size. Um, so this is a complicated way of saying um, it's really important to have our data digitized so that it can be used in studies like this. Otherwise, we just have specimens in a drawer and nobody can, um, can use them for this type of analysis. And of course, um, they also needed specimens to be georeferenced with coordinates so they could um, make these conclusions. So I'm going to zoom back to Nantucket and look a little at the history of our collections here. Um, they date back to 1876 or possibly older for some of the rocks, but um, we don't know for certain about some of them. And I have listed some things here and I left others out. So we've got plants, fossils, insects, birds, mammals, fish, also uh, reptiles, amphibians, marine invertebrates, spiders, algae, fungi, and I might be missing some categories still. Um, so the Murray Mitchell Association was founded in 1902, and just two years later, um, there started to be natural history collections. And um, they have undergone three major moves since then. So we're looking at the Mitchell House here, which was the site of the very first natural history collections in 1904. Um, there they are. Mary Albertson was the very first, first curator, and she had a few swinging books of um, pressed plants. And she started doing talks on birds and butterflies, eclipses, and encouraged geology studies too. Um, let's see. Then there's a move to Hinchman House in 1946. So the history here is that um, Hinchman House was um, gifted to the MMA specifically for the collections of plant and animal life and to hold nature classes. Lydia Hinchman um, bought this large house previously owned by Thomas Coffin um, in 1929 for her family to stay in when they visited Nantucket um, and also to protect the other MMA properties. She needed it to her son with a request that she go to the MMA upon his death. Um, so he died in 1944. And then in June of 1946, um, the specimens were moved <clears throat> and exhibits set up on the first floor. So here is the first floor looking not terribly different than it looks now. Um, the actual specimens were mainly housed on the second floor at that time. Um, then in 1977, this wet lab was built in the basement and it was, well, prior to this time, but um, Edith Andrews, who I know or I knew and many of you, I believe on this, this call knew as well as the um, great ornithologist and longtime curator of the collections. Um, so in uh, 1989, the um, bird cabinets were moved to the basement, and in 1993, the herbaria followed. And um, this was not great because um, there's pretty high humidity and a lack of climate control. So this is how it basically was when I came in 2010. Actually, we didn't have those white cabinets yet. They were added in 2012 um, to try to help keep the hum humidity away from the collections. Um, but it was pretty bad, like water sometimes poured into the basement and we'd be mopping it up in the middle of the night. Um, so then in 2018, we moved over to the research center. Before I talk too much about this, oh, well, I wanna introduce the history of the research center. So um, this shingled building here was actually Mariah's father, William Mitchell's schoolhouse, and it was moved to this location in 1920. And then in 1933, 
that stucco part um, was designed and built um, as a fireproof addition to keep books basically. Um, and so this was used as a science library for decades. And then um, that was kind of phased out and um, now the collections are there. And I think, oh yeah, and we have this great HVAC system that totally helps with our climate control even though we're still mostly in a basement. So at this point, I think I'm gonna show you a little tour of the collections if I can get it to work. Um, all right. Okay, so we're gonna have a tour of the research center. Jack, let me know if that looks too bad. It was sort of pausing a little bit before. So we're gonna enter into the public part where um, anyone can visit if you come in on a Saturday morning or have an appointment to come in. And then I'm gonna take you down the stairs into the um, part where the collections are housed. And partly because um, it's not open to the public because it is totally not accessible because there's very steep, narrow stairs. So here we come into the bird area um, with our lots of bird cabinets. And I'm gonna show you the passerines. Those are the songbirds. Um, so here's a drawer with rose-breasted grosbeaks and buntings. Um, Here's some tanagers and cardinals and warblers and all those other cabinets are full of birds. That one has got mammals and eggs and nests. Over here, these are um, historic insect collections. There's the HVAC system. Then we're looking over at the other insect collections. These are moths collected by Mark Millo. Um, and all the insects are housed in those drawers. Now we're gonna leave the main building and go into the wing. So this is the basement of that fireproof wing and this is the herbarium in this part. We dodge all the poles and look inside. These uh, have little cubbies with all of the herbarium specimens. The one on the left there is from 1909, the one on the right from 2019. Um, we're gonna look around the corner to the marine mammal bones, which are housed on shelves. That's a humpback whale vertebrae, um, a pilot whale skull, in the middle. And then in the back corner is the wet collection. And so this is fish um, right there. Over here, there's some uh, marine invertebrates and snakes and uh, amphibians. And I think that's about it. So now I'm going to give you another tour in the reverse direction, a little bit slower and with more um, details on some of the collections. Um, so we're starting with the wet collection, going backwards. Um, this storage area uses the original shelving from the wing. So that probably dates back to 1933 and the posts actually kind of hold up the building. So we couldn't uh, we needed to use whatever shelving we could within the space. <clears throat> um, basically to prepare a, a fish specimen, um, we just uh, put it in 10% formalin, which fixes the, the fish or stops the decomposition and gives it some rigidity. And then we rinse it in distilled water and step it up through various concentrations of distilled water and ethanol until we get up to 70% ethanol. And that's how we keep it for long-term storage. Um, much of our liquid collection was prepared by Clint Andrews, who's um, Edith's husband and Ginger's dad. 
And there he is with a mantis shrimp. All right, moving on to amphibians. Um, I guess an, a role of collections is to document new introductions to the island. Now this is a Cuban tree frog and I don't think that it would survive the winter outside, but um, it was brought to Nantucket on a shipment of flowers from Florida. Um, so we do have it in our collection and I don't know if one day Nantucket warms up so much that they can survive, we can have a good idea about how they got here. Um, museums can also document past existence of a species that we don't know if it's still on the island. So this is a spadefoot toad. They haven't been seen or heard, I believe, for at least two decades. This one was found as roadkill in 1997 by Bill Maple. And I just oh, love that hind foot. You can see how it's adapted for digging in the sand, burrowing down backwards. <clears throat> um, here are uh, five of our six species of snakes. We have uh, garter snakes, ribbon snakes, water snakes, milk snakes, ring neck snakes, and smooth green snakes on Nantucket. Um, and one of those big data studies shows that um, relative abundance of museum specimens are correlated with relative abundance of species of um, individuals of a species in the wild. And this totally plays out with snakes in our collection. Um, we've got a lot of garter snakes and they are quite abundant on Nantucket. And I think we only have one or two specimens of a smooth green snake, which aren't pictured because they're on display. Um, and they are quite rare on Nantucket, only occurring um, on Kotu. Um, I'm gonna move to marine mammal bones. I don't have a ton to say here, um, although you can see they are using that original shelving as well. There's some polyethylene foam there to protect them. And um, in terms of preparation of marine mammal bones, we let the ocean do the work. We really aren't prepared to um, deal with whale blubber um, in an institution of our, of our size. And then I just wanted to mention that just because we're able to pick up bones off the beach, um, that's actually illegal um, unless you have a, a very complicated permitting. Um, which we do because of the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Um, moving on to the herbarium. This is our storage area. I already kind of mentioned it's uh, complicated because of these poles, which used to be shelving and they hold the building up. So when we moved to this building, we ended up getting these lots of little small cabinets so we could work around the obstacles including um, those poles and also the lights hanging down from the ceiling. So inside each cabinet, like you saw in the video, I have 16 cubbies. In the cubbies are folders. Um, each folder is a genus and within each genus, there's usually multiple species. They're arranged alphabetically, first by family, then by genus, then by species. So like, Aster ACE, which has the asters and goldenrods are at the beginning. And like Typh ACE, which has the cattails is towards the end. Um, that's how we are able to find them. Uh, in terms of the process to prepare a plant specimen, you go out and, and find what you're looking for and then um, identify it and be certain of what it is and you wanna get as much of the plant as you can. So here, um, Kelly got the roots, there's the stem, the leaf, the flower, if you can also the seed. <clears throat> um, then we, let's see, get it, uh, yeah, we press it, then we glue or use linen tape to fix it to some acid-free special herbarium paper and label it with all the data. Um, so ideally this would include coordinates as well as location and habitat description, date, collector, notes on identification. And then we put a barcode on it and we stamp it 
in case we're gonna lend it to another herbarium, they know where to send it back to. Um, and then we database it and image it. Um, now I'm gonna talk about some specific specimens here. So these are among our oldest from um, the 1870s. There were a couple of collectors interested in ferns at that time. Um, one of them, L.L. Dame, who I think collected the cinnamon fern, fern um, is an interesting guy, collected all over New England, and Kelly Omond has been working on a project to try to locate all of his old journals because he didn't really write specific locations on these specimens, just Nantucket or sometimes like wet places on Nantucket. Um, but in his journals, he talks about where he went each day. And so if we can locate those and sort of match up the dates, it would be a great way to figure out exactly where he was finding some of these things. Um, I also wanted to point out there were a bunch of awesome um, female collectors around the turn of the century um, with the gorgeous handwriting who collected hundreds and hundreds of plant specimens. Um, one of them here, let's see, we've got Nellie Flynn. I think she, I can't remember exactly how many, but many hundreds of plant specimens. Elizabeth Kite on the upper left with that very fancy handwriting. Um, then uh, Mary Albertson, um, she was the daughter of the first curator, or no, that's Alice Albertson, was the daughter of the first curator, Mary Albertson. Um, and uh, Grace Brown Gardner also collected a ton and donated her collection to the MMA in the 40s. Um, I actually, this is a specimen co-collected by uh, Grace Brown Gardner and Alice Albertson, and there's many, many specimens where they collected them together. And I just, like this one, the label tells a little story. It's water plantain collected in a ditch near the railroad by Alice and Grace in 1909, and it's really fun to imagine them as friends going out botanizing. Um, so I, I love that aspect of natural history collections as well. Um, in 1965, um, Frank McKeever was uh, doing some botanical projects at the MMA and he had this really beautiful handwriting and refolded most of the herbarium and uh, wrote these uh, genus covers very, very finely. Um, he also published a list of the plants on the island. In um, 1996, Bruce Sorry and um, Dunwitty came and did a flora of Nantucket, um, among other things. They examined the entire herbaria to check the identifications of all of the specimens. Um, this is an example of one from 1909. Um, it was identified as pale smartweed. Um, Peter Dunwoody uh, said, oh no, it's actually climbing false buckwheat. And so that's um, how we classify it now in our herbarium. Um, we, we sort of go with the most recent expert. <clears throat> um, around the year 2000, we were designated by the Nantucket Biodiversity Initiative as the official repository for all specimens collected on the island. and um, uh, for research funded by the NBI. So at that time, we also started to make a move towards digitizing the collections. And so that both means typing everything into a database and also taking images of things, which we didn't really get started with the imaging until about two years ago. <clears throat> but this is the setup for um, imaging the plant specimens. Um, we have been using this database called Specify, which was first developed by folks at the University of Kansas. Um, they, had, they were funded by an NSF grant originally, and now um, they are funded by uh, their member institutions, but they have been so kind as to keep us on since we've been with them since almost the beginning. And so we are, uh, we are using this great software for free. Um, as a, a database like this, 
um, allows us to enter everything in and also attach images. And if you're looking for our plants, you can find them publicly um, at the Consortium of Northeastern Herbaria web portal. And so this is a um, gathering of many institutions across the region, and you can search for um, anything you want really, either a specific species or just um, things within a certain um, year range or something. Here I'm looking up a blue-eyed grass. So once you click search, you get a list, you can click on full record details and then you get to see who collected it, when, where, and if you click on that open image, you would see a blow up of the, um, the image so, so clear that you can zoom right in and count the petals if you want. Um, I'm gonna move to the birds. So I think I mentioned already, we purchased those cabinets back in 2012. And then when we moved into this, space, this basement here, um, we had a really complicated process of lowering these down um, through a bulkhead and uh, we had some very strong helpers help position them into place. So that was a pretty fun thing. Here too, we're also avoiding lots of poles. So it was tricky to arrange these in, the way, in a way that all of the doors can open. Um, in terms of preparing study skins of birds, we first take data, so we measure things. I'm not exactly sure what I'm measuring here. I guess the tail length. And then essentially the idea is to kind of undress the bird, undress the skin off of the carcass of the bird um, so that we're preserving the skin and, and getting rid of all of the um, meat and guts and things that would rot. Once we're finished, we sew it up and kind of uh, lay it out in position and then uh, make sure it gets all of its label data. And then we have a drying oven so that um, these birds get nice and, uh, and dried out and um, kind of like papery, their skin turns sort of papery so that um, they won't rot when we put them in the cabinets. And one reason we make study skins instead of those beautiful mounted birds like you would see from a long time ago is about um, storage space. So you can see the thing in the middle there, it's a great blue heron and it takes a huge amount of space. It's like two and a half feet tall and takes almost the entire cabinet. Um, if we uh, make a study skin of a great blue heron, we can fit like six of them in one little drawer. You could probably put I don't know, three dozen in the amount of space that that one um, mounted one takes up. And so um, it's really about protecting these things so they last a long time. And if they can be in a cabinet, um, then they're protected from humidity and insect damage and things like that. If they're too big to fit in a cabinet, um, there might be bugs chewing on them before long. <clears throat> <coughs> This here is the, the famous red-throated loon, um, which was one of Edith Andrews' first specimens in our collection. It was mailed to her by her future husband while she was studying at Cornell. Um, and she prepared it as a specimen, brought it back um, and worked at the museum. And it, it underwent all of those moves I discussed earlier. Um, this one, brown pelican, is um, a favorite of mine. I think um, Ginger and Edith found it when they were out birding one time. Might have even been like Edith's 98th birthday, if I, I'm remembering right. I'm not sure that I am. But um, it, it was a special find because obviously brown pelicans aren't common on Nantucket. Um, but this one had died and was found on the beach. and. I also have never had the opportunity to uh, look inside a pelican's beak and that felt pretty special too. Um, this one I just prepared when I was on island this winter um, and it was interesting because those blue mussels that you see in the little box there were wedged in that um, eider's throat. 
And I think that this bird died not of choking, but of starvation um, because it was totally emaciated and also its esophagus had lesions in it where that um, those muscles were rubbing against it. Um, so they must have been there for a, a little while at least. But it was very surprising. I didn't know what I was about to find when I um, pulled that out. If you want to find a list of the bird collections, you can go to the Mariah Mitchell's website, go to the science part, go down to collections, over to natural science collection, and just keep scrolling down till you see the birds. And then um, there are lists. So you can click at, on this link and you'll get a list like this. We don't have images of all of our birds yet, although Ken did take some images. So um, those are available by following the, the other link here. <clears throat> I'm gonna move on to mammals. Um, so we don't have very many mammals on Nantucket, nor do we have very many mammal specimens. Um, essentially they're stored and prepared just like birds, or basically just like birds. Um, and I'm gonna show you some specific ones. Here's a Northern long-eared bat. Um, if you haven't heard Daniela Dell talk about these, she and the um, NCF have been studying the new population of Northern long-eared bats. And we have a few specimens from the last few years. Um, this is a, a Muskegit mouse or um, vole actually. It's um, still being debated, I think, whether it's a full species or a subspecies of meadow vole, um, but it's an interesting story of, um, <coughs> of divergence as um, Muskegon is sort of cut off from the mainland and um, these voles are a little bit morphologically different from meadow voles. Although it seems like they share, their DNA is basically indistinguishable. <coughs> there are no raccoons on Nantucket, but this one washed up dead on Kotu. So we have it in our collection. Um, and we do know that, you know, sometimes new species do show up on the island. Like I mentioned the cardinals before, um, white-tailed deer haven't been here forever. Um, nor have gray squirrels. I hope raccoons don't show up on Nantucket because they would really wreak havoc on some of the ecosystems that have um, developed not having scavengers around. This is a weird little Norway rat, maybe a hybrid with an escaped pet or something. <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. Now I'm moving to the insects. So I think I showed you these sort of in the video. Um, these are some of Mark Mello's moths collected in 2004. It's a really nice collection. <clears throat> um, insects are basically pinned, dried and labeled and, and put in drawers and that's all there is to it. Um, we've got a bunch of beetles. Uh, these ones here are mostly carrion beetles collected in conjunction with the American Burying Beetle Study. Um, there's other, other beetles off to the right as well. <clears throat> um, these are all ants and these ants were borrowed by um, Aaron Alice Ellison who wrote this book, The Field Guide to the Ants of New England. And so, um, he basically borrowed these ants to better understand species distributions. And he was kind enough to identify all of them and send them back to us so that we have um, a good list of our ants. Um, these are some of the, the flies collected by Johnson, Charles Johnson in the 1930s. <coughs> and I've been working on curating them and moving them out of some rather moldy boxes into um, these nice drawers. Um, onto spiders. These are um, Emerson spiders from the early 
or the late 1920s. Um, and then Andrew McKenna Foster's um, spiders collected were in the um, 2005 probably to the, I don't know, 2010-ish. There's Andrew. Uh, spiders are essentially um, stored like fish in little vials of ethanol. It is, we use a higher concentration of ethanol and we're careful to use non-denatured ethanol because denatured ethanol can damage DNA. Um, all right, so I'm moving to the fossil collection, fossil shells. And I have to admit to not knowing a ton about these, but these ones were mainly collected in about 1904 to 1905. Um, and I've got this picture from a paper that Howard Johnson published. Um, and I think this might either be Elizabeth Kite, who I mentioned as a botanist, or Mary Albertson. Um, Wilson mentions both of them as being helpful in his studies, but I just love this image of a woman in her dress and big hat climbing up the dune. Um, it's basically gone at this point because of the erosion, but it's just north of the clay head at Sankety. And um, this is what it looked like in about 2012. <clears throat> you can see all these different layers um, and some of them still had fossil shells. Went out there with Andrew in 2012. And these are some of the um, fossils we brought back and I think some kids separated some of them out and then Jessica Cardiff from uh, the Harvard MCZ helped identifying the shells. Um, so if you wanna come, you can visit um, the collections on Saturday morning from 10.30 to noon. Ginger is there. I'm not sure the summer hours will probably be a little bit different. Um, and again, if you wanna find specimens online, for plants, you can go to the Consortium of Northeastern Herbaria and see images as well as lists. And for everything else, go to the Mariah Mitchell website. And for insects, you pretty much just have to email me because they're not all fully digitized yet, so it's complicated. And that's all, thanks. Awesome, thanks so much, Julia. Um, as I mentioned before, if you guys have questions for Julia, feel free to throw them in the Q&A section and we'll go through them and, um, and read your questions. Um, it looks like we already have a couple, but keep them coming, y'all. All righty, first question um, is, how did the deer start off on Nantucket? Uh, I guess, um... I don't know precisely, but there's a story that a deer was seen um, swimming across the harbor and um, somebody dragged it into their boat and finished bringing it over. And then maybe somebody else uh, felt sorry for it and brought a female over. I'm not sure about that story, but that's at least what I've heard. <clears throat> and then a huge population started. <laughs> Jack is kind of frozen at the moment. Awesome. Uh, no. Oh, no, sorry about that, guys. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, the next question is, um, how many specimens are added each year to the collections, and where do they come from these days? That depends um, year to year and um, with the type of organism. So I would say in terms of plants, Kelly Omond is doing a big flora of Nantucket right now, and she is trying to um, collect plants for which there are no recent records, as well as plants that aren't represented in the herbarium before. And so she's been providing us with probably, I don't know, fifth, no, probably closer to a hundred, I would say 50 to a hundred specimens a year over the last few years of plants. And those are all like interesting and new things. Um, then we're getting a number of insect collections from NBI studies. And that ranges, I don't know, in the dozens to hundreds 
every year. And then I would say in terms of birds that are salvaged, it's maybe um, about 15 to 20 a year that we then prepare <clears throat> as specimens. Uh, we probably get more than that in the freezer, but we don't keep every single one because some of them are in bad shape or we've already got loads of those. Um, and then we get some fish um, from Jack and other, other folks at the aquarium. If the, if the fish die, then um, they get added to the collection as well. Um, yeah, that's what comes to my, my mind at, off the top of my head. <clears throat> awesome, next questions. Uh, let's see, uh, what are your responsibilities as the collection manager? What's the job like? <laughs> All right, so um, I come and uh, prepare new specimens, so skin birds and add them to the collection and I um, go around and make sure that everything is safe from bugs and mold. So I um, check the mothballs and make sure that uh, there are new, no insect infestations. Um, I do a lot of databasing, so collections that we don't actually have a great list of what we have. I'm trying to make a digital list so that we know and can, can uh, compare uh, what we are finding now with some of those old records. Um, I answer questions and from researchers that might be looking for specimens or parts of specimens and send them what they need if I can, um, or, or meet them at the collection sometimes and let them look. Um, that's, that's basically the range of responsibilities. Oh yeah, and then there's permitting, which is not my favorite part, but it is a part. <laughs> Awesome. Um, next question. Uh, is there a replacement species uh, that could replace the eelgrass that seems to be disappearing? I'm going to toss that back to you, Jack, because I'm, I'm no expert on that. <laughs> and you are. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm actually not sure, you know, how many seagrass species are in the collection. Um, perhaps just maybe Zostera, um, but um, yeah, I think, I think we're, we're thinking about uh, trying to, you know, preserve the eelgrass we already have. Um, and, you know, we're thinking about visors into the harbor and, and things like that. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't think we're thinking about replacing the eelgrass quite yet. Um, there are a bunch of um, folks around uh, New England that are, including the Nantucket Land Council, um, that are doing eelgrass transplants um, to restore eelgrass in parts of the harbor that have um, lost eelgrass or are good like candidate habitats for um, new eelgrass beds. I will say I just um, was looking really quick at our database and and yeah, it looks like Zostera is what it is, or what we have in the herbarium. <clears throat> awesome. <laughs> um, one more question from Andrew. Um, what does the future of the collections look like? Um, do you have plans for more digitization? For sure. Um, basically, the, the collection that's the least digitized is the insect collection. And um, I've been working on uh, getting a good list of that um, for many years and I'm not done yet. Um, so that's, that's a big part of it. I think in terms of imaging more of the collection, yes, that's on the docket too, but um, we might, yeah, we have the equipment at this time. It's uh, a matter of figuring out how to orchestrate it and how to host the images and um, yeah, part of it is the, the portal situation is complicated, but yeah, I think the goal is gonna be more, more digitizing and um, adding more collections as they come. Alrighty, I think I'm back. <laughs> Sorry, guys, I've been having some um, internet difficulties. Um, 
Julia, I have a question for you. Sure. What is your favorite specimen in the Mariah Mitchell collection? Oh, no. <laughs> That's hard. Um, well, uh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I'm very fond of saw wet owls. I, they're really super cute and have soft and fuzzy feet. So I enjoy them. Um, I, yeah, I mean, that red threaded loon that I showed is pretty special because it's got that really sweet connection um, to Edith and also Clint. Um, so, yeah. <clears throat> Awesome. I think that is all of the questions. Um, Julia, I wanted to thank you so much um, for joining us for our speaker series. Thank you, everyone, um, those of you who attended tonight and uh, those watching the recording. Um, I wanted to thank our sponsors one last time again and encourage you all to stop by in two weeks' time, and that would be uh, April 20th at 7 p.m. for our final speaker for the series, Meg Thatcher, to learn about um, astronomy and astronomy education. Um, and yeah, thanks so much for joining us tonight and have a fabulous rest of your evening. Thank Bye you. Bye, everyone. Good night.